you probably know about this. You've probably seen this um, already. I don't think these work at 50%. <clears throat> but there's a meeting next week. Wednesday, 17th, 3 p.m., Pet Call 301, with Mike Tesh, who's the Director of Human uh, Resources at Kirkland's. If you know what Kirkland's is, you know, it's home decorating kind of um, thing, um, who is an English major himself. Uh, apparently, a survey that uh, the department did last fall of English majors, one of the things that the vast majority of people on the survey replied is, what can I do with an English major degree, kind of a thing. And so, um, the chair reached out, found this guy who is willing to come. We're inviting graduate students, English majors, English minors, and we're holding it in Peck Hall 301, which is a seminar room that holds 15 people. Um, hopefully we're expecting a larger turnout we have another room set up as a backup because I'm going to email the chair today and suggest you know we might want to see if we have a backup space because we, we might get more than 15 people you know with 150 200 English majors I don't know how many graduate students and God knows how many minors hopefully we'll have more than 15 if we have fewer than 15, we might as well just close down the English department because we're not doing any good anyways. Because nobody gives a rat, so you know what? Okay, so that's next week. Um, probably if you're looking for a job, you can, you know, talk to them about going to work for Kirkland's if you want. Um, also, I thought I emailed this, but I've been reliably informed that I did not. I extended the deadlines for the recitations for the Lord's Prayer, Old English Lord's Prayer today. So if you haven't done it and you want to do it, practice first <laughs> and do it. When I say practice, do like four or five recordings. I mean, obviously not everybody has a Mac, but if you have a Mac and you have, what is that stupid thing called? Photo booth, put it on video and just do it several times. And then, you know, delete the bad ones and then just send the good one. Okay. Or use your phone. Everybody has a phone. I know very few people who do it. That's fine if you don't. Borrow somebody else's, steal somebody else's, record a video, and send it to me. But practice it, okay? Middle English one, Tuesday. Same day the papers do, okay? Not because I'm mean, because, you know, frankly, your papers should be done well before then, and it's just, you know, percolating, and you're going to go back and revise, you know, do some minor editing maybe Monday night, etc. And you can, you know, do your Middle English Lord's Prayer at the same time, maybe over your paper if you want, okay? Um, and then Early Modern English, the final Tuesday of class, which is very fitting because April 23rd is what? Shakespeare's birthday and death day. So you could do it in celebration of his birthday or if you think it's really bad, you know, that you're dying with him, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> All things to all people. Okay, so there's, that's enough for that stuff. All right, so we left off with, if I remember correctly, discussing, where you go, Alexander Pope's comment in Essay and Criticism, sons or fathers failing language see, and such as Chaucer's, or Chaucer is, shall Dryden be. Chaucer to Pope was unintelligible, not literally, but, you know, it's pretty foreign, okay? And he's saying Dryden's language will be as unintelligible to current father's sons. Now, obviously, he's being a bit hyperbolic there. He doesn't mean literally the next generation is not going to be able to understand John Dryden's language, but he's saying language is changing fast, that fast. Imagine if Pope lived in the 20th century and saw the change, because the 20th century is one of the greatest periods of change. And unfortunately, we don't discuss it, because we don't have time. We're going to, we'll probably run out of time before that, okay? So, because of that perceived 
I noticed my perceived. Because of that perceived radical change, rapid change in the language, you had a variety of people essentially suggest we need to do some things to the language. That is, we need to attempt to fix the language. Okay? So, how do you do that? 2.1. Reduce the language to rules. What are the correct rules of English? Okay? And ascertain a certain standard of English. Okay? <coughs> That idea of yeah, I'm getting rid of this now. So. That idea of ascertainment. Okay, is almost in opposition to the notion that you could use to summarize the Renaissance. What word was that? Enrichment. Enrichment. Okay. Because this means what? Just let everything happen. Let all these words come in. Create words if you don't have a word that works. No rules. Okay. Ascertainment is one. I mean, what if we were to use the word ascertain today? What what does it mean? If you ascertain something, what does that mean? Look, look what's this part of it? If something is certain, it's what? It's sure. It's not doubtable. It's fixed. So to ascertain the language partially means to fix it. Fix in both meanings of it. Okay? Fix as in to make it stable. So make it stable and fix as to what? If a clock is broken, do you just throw it away, or do you correct it? Fix as in to correct, to repair, okay? And you do both of these on the basis of the first part of that. Rules, okay? Now notice how different that is, again, from the Renaissance. The Renaissance liked, Mulcaster liked the fluidity of the language. It's very lack of stability. He emphasized, not that it was incorrect, but that it was flexible to do whatever you needed to do with it. Okay? And there were no rules for it. Lack of spelling standardization, for example. Well, that's one of the things that they wanted to come up with rules for. And by the way, this notion, it's not peculiar to the Restoration in the 18th century. We could go back to the 14th century and a guy named Orm, who wrote the Ormulum. Okay? And what's, what is he doing in his Ormulum? He is trying to, it's this, it's this really long didactic poem. That is his teaching, but it's really boring. Okay, one of the things he does in there is he, without how do I want to put this, without entirely setting his rules forth, he sets about a spelling standardization. For example, I think it is, I could be wrong here, if a vowel is going to be long. Either the vowel should be doubled, or the consonant that comes after it should be doubled. It's one of those two. And he does this repeatedly. He does this stably all throughout, I think it's 30,000 lines. It's really, really long. Right? So he's not the first one, you know, they're not the first ones to come up with this. But nobody listens to Orm. Literally, nobody, nobody follows that. Okay? And nobody else tried that kind of spelling reform during the Middle Ages or during the Renaissance. We get some of that during the Restoration 18th, 18th century, which we'll talk about in a moment, with the rise of dictionaries and such. Okay. 
So, what else? To refine the seeming defects in the language. Okay, so notice, I mean, the way I put that, it seems a bit anomalous, because how do you refine a defect? Because to refine means to what? To make something better than what it is. So how do you refine a defect? You make that defect even more defective? No, it's not what it means. It's to correct the defect, okay? But the refining part is you're doing what? You're refining the language. Think of a sifter, and you throw the language in the sifter, and you shake it back and forth. What's coming out? The defects. What's left? Ah, the pure English language, okay? And to permanently fix the language, notice, to resist change. That's all of this. Okay? That's all of this. So how do you fix a language to resist change? Or to stop change? You just can't. And I'm going to read part of Johnson's preface. Okay? Samuel Johnson's preface to his dictionary, massive dictionary, that he produces by himself, we'll talk about that, where he says, you know, when he started, he had it as his goal to do this. And after nine years of working on the dictionary by himself, he realizes, well, it's a fool's errand. You can't do this. And he mentions other groups that had tried to do this, okay, groups that I'm going to have mentioned up here, Italy, France, etc., their academies, okay? So, coming kind of simultaneous with this, you have linguistic academies sprout up. I don't mean they sprout up like grassroots organizations. They sprout up because they are some scholar's idea. That is, people who consider themselves to be masters of the language, or the language is for the countries that they're in, come up with this idea, and they say, we ought to establish a, well, let's use modern American government ease. Let's establish a national commission, a blue ribbon panel, who to fix the English language. Who's going to be on that blue ribbon panel? Are you going to have Snoop Dogg on it? Mm, probably not. Are you going to have Kanye on it? Hell no. <laughs> Who's going to be on it? Who, who ranks at the top of the quote-unquote American English language? Okay, you would say no one. I think there are probably some. I think some people would probably say professors. Uh, John McWhorter, who's a professor at, I think, at Columbia, he's a linguist, teaches history of the English language, he's a, a public intellectual, he writes regular columns for the New York Times, Wa uh, Wall Street Journal, various other things, much of what he writes about is language in the public sphere, okay, he would be one, Stephen L. Carter would probably be another one, George Will would probably be another one, because you often need a dictionary in order to read George Will, uh, if he were still alive, Charles Krauthammer would have been one. William Sapphire would have been one. William F. Buckley would have been one. Okay, All people who make their living with words. Right? Because they have large devoted followings. And because each one of them acknowledged a master. I mean, they just know how to use words better than anybody else. And maybe some playwrights some novelists, and folks like that, okay? So, we're going to do that, and they're, this is their goal. Well, that's exactly what the purpose is of these. The Academy of <coughs> Krushka, Krushka, or Krushka, in 15, notice, 1582. That's when Mulcaster is praising Elizabethan English to the not quite denigration of Latin. Right? They produce a dictionary, what, 30 years later. 
Why produce a dictionary? You found an academy for the purposes of defending the language. Why produce a dictionary? What's the dictionary do for the language? It does that. It fixes it, right? Because now if you need to look to figure out how to spell a word, you have a dictionary. If you need to find out what a word means, you have a dictionary. You have an authoritative source. Okay? France comes up with one, the Academy Francaise in 1635. <coughs> so England joins the act. Notice, Europe does it first. England, you know, tail on the dog, so to speak. Almost 100 years after Italy, the Royal Society forms an exploratory, I mean, government at work perfectly, an exploratory committee to do what? To form a committee to propose an academy. So you have, to pro, you have the proto-committee to form the committee to form one. Okay? 60. <coughs> Who's this? Daniel Defoe. Little novelist, right? What did he write? Anybody read the book? Guy who gets shipwrecked on an island? Can I ring any bells? I'm not going to give you a title. 1697. <laughs> Daniel Defoe proposes an academy. Okay? Twelve nobles. What's nobles? How is parliament divided? House of Lords, House of Commoners, or Commons, okay? Because they don't think of themselves as commoners. Commons. So, 12 nobles, that's 12 lords, 12 peers of England, 12 gentlemen, <coughs> that's <coughs> commons, not commoners, because gentlemen are still people who have some land. They're not the, you know, the guy... Uh, Shoveling out the sewer in the middle of the street. Okay. Oh, and 12 commoners. There's the guy shoveling the sewer. Okay. 12 nobles, 12 gentlemen, 12 commoners. 36 people. Okay. So he proposes that. Notice they form an exploratory committee to propose an academy. 1712. Jonathan Swift. Anybody, please? Two major things, at least. Gulliver's Travels and A Modest Proposal, one of the greatest satires ever written, okay? To deal with the famine, got excess children, cut them up and eat them. If you've never read A Modest Proposal, you really, you have to, okay? It's... It's just sheer genius. So, he issues a proposal for collecting, improving, and ascertaining the English language. Swift was a, was a, you know, I hate to use this term today because it, it doesn't have its meaning that it had back then. Swift was a real conservative. Okay? What does that mean? He wants to preserve the best that the past had delivered forward, okay? So, he, he, he doesn't like all this radical change, you know, these upstarts coming around today, okay? All three of these came to naught, to use a Britishism. They came to nothing. They never did propose an academy. This academy went nowhere. The swift proposal, nothing done with it. Why? Well, the inherent conservativeness of language. That is, and I'll be a little, what, are, what, what do you want to call this? Um, nativist? Probably not the right term. The Brits were smaller, smarter than the French and the Italians. They realize, we can't do this. It won't work. France still has this academy. France still has 
literal laws regulating words. How so? You can't just create a word in French. You can't just automatically borrow a word from another language. I mean, yeah, in and among yourselves, yes. Okay. But French does what? It takes a word from a foreign language and it, it, it Frenchifies it. That's not the word I want. <laughs> you know, if it were English, you would say it anglicizes it. It Frank, I don't know what the word would be. But it does. Louder? But it does. It does. It Frenchifies it, okay? It makes it French, okay? So, um, I don't, if I remember correctly, I don't think French, for example, has the word hamburger. German does. Danish does. They take the English word. It's like der hamburger, okay? French makes up another word in French for the French word for ham and the French word for burger, and if they don't have one, it creates it. Why? It's got to be a French word. We don't deal with this foreign, you know, clap crap. But look at France today. I mean, they're dealing with all kinds of foreign clap crap. Okay? <laughs> so, the English realized this won't work. And they never produced it. Okay? So what happens? Stone keeps rolling. Language keeps changing. Until you get the rise of English dictionaries. But... Now we've got to go back in time a little bit because the first quote unquote real take that back. Well, the first real dictionary is what this is a very, very, very small selection of. Samuel Johnson's dictionary, okay? Produced in 1755. But before then you have glosses and glossaries. I could bring in copies of you know Anglo-Saxon manuscripts that have Glosses written all over the side. Okay, so a gloss is where you have something in the original text you're reading, and you write off something to the side as an explanation of something in the original text. For example, you come across a word you don't understand, you look it up, and you write it in the side. Or maybe not the case you look it up, but the manuscript you're reading, say, is in Latin. And you underline a word, and then off in the margin, you put that word in Old English. Okay? That's an example of glossing. A glossary is a list of those. Or, as we get in modern English textbooks, a list of hard words at the back of the book. Usually those hard words, like in your textbook, are in bold print, right? So that you then know these are the important words. These are the words you're going to get tested on. So, Robert Cogri, so, I mean, you have this going back to the Anglo-Saxon period. So, Anglo-Saxon through the Middle English period. Then you get Robert Cogri, Table Alphabetical of Hard Words. Now, what does that sound like it is? Not table, this kind of table. Table like insert, table in a document. And that's what it is. You turn the pages on this thing, and it's just one table after another, of hard words. And it starts with the letter A. It goes through the end of the alphabet. It's just a listing of hard words. Okay? Does it tell you what part of speech it is? Does it tell you how it's pronounced? And I don't think it gives any definition. I've looked at it before. Um, go through the library's research gateway. Get on EEBO, Early English Books Online, then you can look at this. Okay? Um, that's Cogby. Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, 1755. Now, there are some other works between here. Okay? But for our purposes, they're not that important. There's one by a guy named, I'm uh, drawing a blank on his first name. His last name is Gill. Okay? mid, I want to say sometime 1620, 1650 or so, okay? But Johnson, Dictionary of the English Language, and I don't have anything here in here large enough to give you an idea of how big it is. It's a folio size 
which folio refers to how many times a sheet is folded when it's printed. It's about this wide by about that tall. Two volumes, each one about that thick. All right? Took him nine years by himself. Now, he did have some assistance, T-S, not C-E ending, um, in the sense of he had some quote-unquote boys, you know, finding words in books and manuscripts and, and things like that. But in terms of the overall production of the thing, Johnson did it on his own. He had a patron, right, Lord Chesterfield, but his patron wasn't very patronizing. And we know that from a couple of things. One of them is his definition of patron that he gives us the book, right? Because Johnson, unlike any of these earlier things, Johnson gives us the format for every dictionary subsequent to him. That is, every dictionary after Samuel Johnson, the Dictionary of the English Language, follows his format. Okay. He uses quotations to illustrate meaning. Most of the time. Because some of his meanings are very idiosyncratic. They are so idiosyncratic, they are idiosyncratic to Johnson himself. <laughs> that is, he's the only one who thinks this. He's the only one who asserts this meaning for the word. Why? Because he's also using the book a little bit as a cudgel. <laughs> Feeding people with it. People he doesn't like. Like his patron, for example. Okay? Or the Scots. He's going to say some things about, you know, the Scots dealing with oats, oatmeal, etc. Okay? So, eccentric definitions, what I call idiosyncratic. For example, and we'll look at a couple of these. Tory, wig, pension, oats. Ex excise, lexicographer, network, fart, piss, patron, etc. Okay. The preface, which I think if you click on that link in the electronic version, uh, it'll take you to it. If not, I'll send, resend it. And you really ought to read this. It's not that long. Right? Um, because of what he says. And I want to point out, or I'm going to read just a couple of passages. I'm not going to start with the beginning. I'm going to essentially start with the um, start with the end. Actually, I am going to read. Opening two paragraphs. It is the fate of those who toil at the lower employments of life to be rather driven by the fear of evil than attracted by the prospect of good. To be exposed to censure without hope of praise, to be disgraced by miscarriage or punished for neglect, where success, would, where success would have been without applause and diligence without reward. Okay? Now, he doesn't write this at the beginning of the nine years. He writes this at the conclusion, after he's done. Okay? Among these unhappy mortals is the writer of dictionaries. Okay, now, what did he say in that opening paragraph? It's the fate of those who toil at the lower employments of life to be driven rather by the fear of evil than attracted by the prospect of good. Prospect of good. To be exposed to censure without hope of praise. What's a modern phrase for that? To be exposed to censure without hope of praise. You are damned if you do and damned if you don't. You can't win. Either you're going to get raped across the coals, or you're not going to receive any positive word. Okay? So, among these unhappy mortals is the writer of dictionaries, whom mankind have considered not as the pupil, but the slave of science. The pupil, the studier of, but the slave of. The one that science makes demands of. The pioneer of literature, doomed only to remove rubbish 
and clear obstructions from the paths of learning and genius. He's talking about this idea. This is what people think the writer of dictionary should do. Who press forward to conquest and glory without bestowing a smile on the humble drudge that facilitates their progress. Every other author may aspire to praise. The lexicographer can only hope to escape reproach, and even this negative recompense has been yet granted to very few. I have, notwithstanding this discouragement, attempted a dictionary of the English language. That is, nevertheless, let loose the dogs of war. I'm going for it. I know what I'm in for. Which, while it was employed in the cultivation of every species of literature, that is, the English language. The English language is what the witch refers to. Okay? Has itself been hitherto neglected. He's writing this in about 1755. Up to now, our language has been neglected, suffered to spread under the direction of chance into wild exuberance. There's the Renaissance. Resigned to the tyranny of time and fashion, and exposed to the corruptions of ignorance and caprices of innovation. Fourth paragraph. When I took the first survey of my undertaking, that is, when I sat down and I thought, okay, Sam, how are you going to do this? And he kind of takes a broad view of the whole language. I found our speech copious without order. Copious was one of those words Molecaster used. Man, it's rich. We just keep adding words to it, and it makes it more copious, okay? But without order. Energetic, without rules. Wherever I turned my view, there was perplexity to be disentangled, confusion to be regulated. Choice was to be made out of boundless variety, without any established principle of selection. That is, I had to make a choice what was right, what was wrong, and I didn't have what. I didn't have kind of a standard to refer to. There was no heartbreak handbook. Okay. Adulterations were to be detected without a settled test of purity. Modes of expression to be rejected or received without the suffrages of any writers of classical reputation, Homer, Cicero, Plato, etc., or acknowledged authority. That is, there were phrases, there, there were ways of speaking. I had to decide whether or not these were appropriate. And I didn't have an authority, a great writer, that I could appeal to. Okay? So, Go from there to almost the end, and he says, Of the event of this work, for which having labored it with so much application, I cannot but have some degree of parental fondness. It is natural to form conjectures. That is, it's like my child. So be, be careful. <laughs> Those who have been persuaded to think well of my design. Now, that implies... Some do. Notice, he's not been writing this in secret. People have known what he's doing. He's, he's let the word get out. So, those who have been persuaded to think well of my design require that it should fix our language and put a stop to those alterations which time and chance have hitherto been suffered to making it without opposition. With this consequence, I will confess I flattered myself for a while. What does he mean? I thought I could. I flattered myself. What do you do when you flatter yourself? What is all flattery? Ultimately. It's, thank you. It's not true. <laughs> It's not true. Okay? So I lied to myself, thinking I could do this. But now begin to fear that I have indulged expectation which neither reason 
nor experience can justify. When we see men grow old and die at a certain time, one after another, from century to century, we laugh at the elixir that promises to prolong life to a thousand years. The Philosopher's Stone, the elixir of life. And with equal justice, may the lexicographer be derided, who, being able to produce no example of a nation that has preserved their words and phrases from mutability, nope, nope, didn't work, shall imagine that his dictionary can, and I love his use of this word, embalm his language. Because what do you embalm? Dead things. You only embalm dead things. What languages today do not change at all? Sanskrit? <laughs> Latin? Homeric Greek? Okay. All the dead ones. All the dead ones. They're unchanging. Why? Nobody speaks them. I mean, yeah. Some people do in classes in ancient Greek and ancient Sanskrit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, can a bomb his language and secure it from corruption and decay? Well, yeah, when something's already dead. That is in his power to change. If you think you can do that, then you think that it is in his power to change sublunary nature. What's he mean by sublunary? Those of you who have had me for Britlet 1 before should know this. Here's the earth. Here's the earth. Here's the moon. And outside that, so the moon's orbit is that, according to the Ptolemaic, the old conception of the universe, you got nine spheres. Okay? Everything from the moon to earth is obviously sublunary. But what does it really mean? Mutable, changeable, impermanent, unstable. So he's saying that in, the, in his power to change sublunary nature. What's he say? What's he saying about the language? At its very heart, it's changeable. Or clear the world at once from folly, vanity, and affectation. Okay? But he says, with this hope, academies have been instituted. What hope? That they could fix their language. And also, I think Johnson is saying, those Italians and French... They, stopped, they, they thought they could stop chance. Bring it into it. Not literally, but in terms of their language. Okay? But he says, all in vain. They haven't been able to. Okay? Let's go on a little bit. There are likewise internal causes. That is, he talks about why some of these things can't be stopped. There are internal causes. The language most likely to continue long without alteration. That is, the language most likely to stay the same for a long period of time would be that of a nation raised a little and but a little above barbarity, secluded from strangers and totally employed in procuring the conveniences of life. So what would that nation be focused on? Survival. And I never thought about it before. But boy, knowing Johnson, he might be talking about the colonies there. Because Johnson didn't like colonial problems. Because he lived until early 1790s. He didn't care for the American Revolution. Why? It went against monarchical government, I mean, at its very essence. So he says, totally employed in, in procuring the, inconvenience, the conveniences of life, either without books, or like some of the Mohammedan Muslim countries, 
having only such words as common use requires. Now, notice the nativist bias there, because what does he know about Muslim countries and Muslim culture? N nil, right? Skip a little bit more. There's another cause of alteration that is change in the language, more prevalent than any other, but yet in the present state of the world cannot be obviated. That is, it can't be stopped. What is that change or that cause? A mixture of two languages will produce a third distinct from both. And they will always be mixed, where the chief part of education, the most conspicuous accomplishment, is skill in ancient or in foreign tongues. He that has long cultivated another language will find its words and combinations crowd upon his memory. What's he getting at? What did we see with Middle English? The year 1250. Before 1250, English speakers learning French. And they're borrowing French into their language. After 1250, French speakers learning English, borrowing their words into English. That's what he means when he says, we'll find its words, the words they've studied, the words they've known, crowd upon his memory. That is, they start to occupy places in the mind so that without even thinking of it, you refer to beef instead of cow, mutton instead of pork. So, conclusion. In this work, when it shall be found that much is omitted, notice what he admits there. I'm not perfect. I do omit some. Let it not be forgotten that much likewise is performed. So before you haul me up in front of the firing squad, proverbial, bear in mind what I have done. And though no book was ever spared out of tenderness to the author, and the world is little solicitous to know whence proceeded the faults of that which it condemns, yet it may gratify curiosity to inform it that the English, my English dictionary, was written with little assistance of the learned. He means, I didn't get people from Oxford and Cambridge to help me. And Johnson wasn't a quote-unquote PhD. He had an honorary master's degree. Why honorary? Because he was one of the most prolific writers of his age. And without any patronage of the great, slam at his patron, by the way, who was a lord, who should be considered great, not in the soft obscurities of retirement, that is, I wasn't in my golden years, you know, living off my millions, or under the shelter of academic bowers, I wasn't in some ivory tower where, you know, all I had to do was every now and do, every now and then give a lecture and then, you know, just do my research. But amidst inconvenience and distraction in sickness and in sorrow, his mother died, for example, during the period that he was writing this. And in order to pay for his mother's funeral costs, he, what's the verb I want? He whipped out. In a matter of days, Rasulus, the Prince of Abyssinia. If you've never read it, read it. Really, really good. And it may repress the triumph of malignant criticism to observe that if our language is not here fully displayed, I have only failed in an attempt which no human powers have hitherto completed. What's he essentially saying? You think you can do better? Belly up to the bar. Let's see you try. If the lexicons of ancient tongues, now immutably fixed, those ancient tongues are immutably fixed, right? People aren't adding Latin words to Caesar. And comprised in a few volumes, be yet, after the toilet of successive ages, inadequate and delusive. So he's saying... Even our dictionaries of ancient languages are inadequate. If the aggregated knowledge and cooperating diligence of the Italian academicians did not secure them from the censure of Beni, a Italian writer, if the embodied critics of France, when 50 years had been spent upon their work, 
were obliged to change its economy and give their second edition another form. Okay. Why do you need a second edition? Because there's problems with the first edition. So if they had to come out with a second edition of their dictionary, then their first edition, first edition was missing something. Or what happened between the first edition and the second edition? The language changed. Oops. I may surely be contented without the praise of perfection, which, if I could obtain in this gloom of solitude, what would it avail me? I have protected my work till most of those whom I wish to please have sunk into the grave. Now, he's probably talking about famous writers. The famous writers I wish to please, they're, they're dead now. I'm still sucking air. And success and miscarriage are empty sounds. I therefore dismiss it with frigid tranquility, having little to fear or hope from censure or from praise. In other words, here it is. Do with it what you want. Censure me, praise me, I don't care anymore. I'm done with it. Okay? Now, the preface is pretty powerful when you consider, again, what one man did. Johnson, in fact, has this little aphorism, you know, it took one Englishman nine years to produce what it took. I think the number is 100 Frenchmen, 50 years. So one Englishman, nine years. 100 Frenchmen, 50 years. I'd say that's pretty good. Pretty good spread there. Okay. So let's look at a couple of words. We won't look at all of these. Patron. Just to give you an idea of the kinds of things he likes to include. Patron. One who countenances, supports, or protects. Commonly, a wretch who supports with insolence and is paid with flattery. Okay. That's a definition. To, to patronage. To patronize. To protect. A bad word. To patronage. He means making patronage, a noun, into a verb. Don't do that. That's a bad word. Okay? What else? And then he gives an example of that. Okay? From Shakespeare. To patronage. Okay? What else? Um, oats. A grain which in England is generally given to horses, but in Scotland supports the people. Johnson, if you've ever had a course, if you let me put it this way, if you've never had a course in the 18th century, Johnson had a um, well, I'll call him what he's known, known as a biographer, James Boswell. Boswell was a Scot. Okay? His father was a lord, a laird in Scottish. And Boswell moved down to London. Why? Because London's where the literary, you know, circuit was really happening. And Johnson would hold forth at a local pub, okay? And all the literary, you know, magnets of the day would hang out there. And John and Boswell, who was kind of a nobody, he'd go and, and he'd say, ooh, Mr. Johnson, can I, you know, and he'd sit and listen. And he and Johnson, he led Johnson on a tour of Scotland, okay? Change Johnson's opinion of the Scots a little bit. That was after this dictionary, okay? So that's why he makes the comment about Scott. Plus, he's English, and the English don't like Scots, and vice versa. Goes back a long, long time, okay? Tory and Whig. Okay, Tory, as it is today, is one who supports the government, then one who is a supporter of the crown. Tory, a cant term derived, I suppose, from an Irish word signifying a savage. He has that all in parentheses. Here's his definition. One who adheres to the ancient constitution of the state and the apostolical hierarchy of the Church of England, opposed to a Whig. Apostolical hierarchy. The Church of England is the Church of Christ, period. Apostolic succession, the whole nine yards. And then he gives a quote from Joseph Addison. 
an 18th century writer contemporary of Johnson. Okay, So, opposed to a Whig. So what's a Whig? Because we had a Whig party in the United States, bear in mind. W-H. Well, in Whig, the name of a faction. What's a faction? It, it never has a positive connotation. It's always what? A little splinter group. A little, you know, sniping away. Okay? And then he talks about the Southwest countries, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? A whole bunch of other definitions. So what does Johnson do? Why is it so important? Well, Johnson tells us, in some instances, he doesn't always, tells us the part of speech, whether it's a verb, noun, etc. Okay? He gives illustrative quotations, beginning with the oldest, because sometimes he gives multiple, and then up to the most recent. Okay? Every now and then he'll have a pronunciation comment, he doesn't have any kind of phonetic alphabet to use, but he'll say, you know, rhymes with, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this is, this is new in the world and pretty significant. Okay? Um, okay. English grammarians. God, it's 8.55, so we have 30 minutes. Grammarians. John Wallace. Notice, 1653. So no real grammar, so to speak, that we think of as a grammar, a listing of rules, of do's and don'ts, before then. Notice what he writes in it. It's in Latin. Right? Grammatica linguae anglicanae. One of the most important early English grammars, though written in Latin. Right. Yeah, I wish I could fit that on top of that or on the bottom of that next page. By what? A professor of geometry. You have a mathematician writing about rules of language. He's not even a professor of Latin okay, or Greek. At least they'd be language professors. Right? So, Coming out of him, kind of the importance of formal logic, the use of Latin as a standard in grammars, while at the same time ignoring the validity of popular usage. What does that mean, ignoring the validity of popular usage? So, if Latin becomes the model, what does that mean? How do you make an infinitive in Latin? It's inflectional ending. How do you make an infinitive in English? So you have the verb run. Notice there's a gap between those. But let's let's go off pop culture. To boldly go, Star Trek. Why is that actually good English? To boldly go, it's the ambit contaminant. English, the English language is in its natural rhythm, iambic. Okay? So, but you shouldn't do this, according to grammarians. Why? You separated this from this. You have split the infinitive. So you should say boldly to go or to go boldly. Either of those. But it doesn't sound right. Why? Because our ears want to go with kind of iambic pentameter. Okay? So, you have the use of Latin as a standard. You have mathematics, as we've already talked about numerous times. Double negatives cancel each other out. Therefore, you shouldn't say not never. Or as Chaucer and even Shakespeare sometimes does, use triple negatives. Popular usage merely refers to how, not necessarily how it's being used on the street, 
popular in the sense of popular writers, okay? which in this period, we would say the quote unquote popular writers, people like, let's go back a little bit, Pope, Dryden, Swift, Defoe, Johnson, Addison and Steele in their spectator papers, okay? Various playwrights, those are the popular writers. They are all quote unquote part of the canon of English literature today. That is, they're the standard by which we judge today, okay? And yet, you had people correcting their writing. People like Johnson correcting their writing. Okay? Prescription versus description and proscription. So, prescription, G, actually, I'm going to change that. Prescriptive, descriptive, proscriptive. Just start with the descriptive. A descriptive grammar does what? Describes. And does not do what? Either of these. Okay. Why? Because these are, are essentially what? These are rules. Prescriptive, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Proscriptive, essentially the same. If something's prescribed, it's not, yes, it's don't do this. Like a prohibition, don't do that. So, thou shalt not end a sentence with a preposition. Why? Because Latin, it is a preposition. It can't come at the end. It always comes before, okay? Prescription, description, post proscription. Why? Who says you can't start a sentence with a conjunction? And? Well, because it's a conjunction. It's supposed to be joining. Robert Loaf. And I've got, no, I did not bring it in. I've got a book called um, Grammars and That Grammar. The And That Grammar is talking about Bishop Robert Loaf. Okay? Short Introduction to English Grammar, 1762. Most influential of all English grammars written in English. This thing went through numerous editions. Okay. Like up into the early 20th century. People are still using it. Now, what's his title? Bishop. Do you think he's descriptive? This is how the language is used, or prescriptive or proscriptive. He's this. He is prescribing. This is what you should do, and this is what you should not do. Okay? If any of you have, because you're English majors, most of you, um, some of you might have H. W. Fowler's. Modern English Usage, I think is the title of it. Early 20th century, okay? Modern English Usage, it's just about this size. It's telling you how to use certain words and how not to use certain words. For example, if you have a sentence that has a word different and you're comparing two things, What kind of word needs to come after? So, um, water is different something. What's the word that goes here? From? Than. Quote, unquote, in correct English, it's than. Why? This is comparative. It's not then, that's adverbial. Every one of you probably will turn in a paper that will have this mistake once. Why? 
because you probably pronounce these two words the same in speech. You'll talk about, you know, yeah, well, then I, but it's different than, and you say the same thing. It's not different from, okay, in quote unquote correct English. But a lot of people use that. A lot of quote unquote correct writers use that. So why isn't it correct? Because <coughs> people like Loth came up with that rule, okay? What's the modern rule book for you guys? Heartbreak. It's the only book I'd really, really be willing to burn. Well, I'll take that back. You're absolutely right. Most of them having to do with English rules and such. And if you're not an English major in your psychology or something, okay, or you're a journalist, AP style, etc. Those, those are your rule books, right? Tell you right now, you going to graduate school? Any of you are going to plan on going to graduate school in English? When I used to teach the bibliography and, and methods of research course, which for a period of a few years I taught every semester, so I had every graduate student that came through the department. I said, you know, if you're a religious person, if you're a Christian and you have a Bible on your nightstand, move the Bible over. Put the MLA there. Because you need to know this thing inside and out. You need to have it down perfectly. Not anymore. Why? Because I don't even have the 8th edition. Because from what I've seen of it, it's absolutely detestable. It would be one of the first ones I would throw on the funeral pile. Right? But, yeah, you got to know this. You submit an article for publication. It says, follow MLA citation and formatting. If the editor opens it and it doesn't, they don't send it back. It gets round filed and disappears forever. And you don't hear back from that person. Right? That's how important following that style, correctness, guide is. Okay? Um, so, summary of restoration, 18th century. Reactionary. How is it reactionary? Reactionary always implies what? First part of the word. React against something that comes before, right? So, it's reacting against what? The freedom, fluidity, the enrichment of the Renaissance, the no rules, the no holds barred, okay? It's reactionary. Ascertainment is that all important word. Emphasis on rules, notice, largely artificial ones. I mean, all the rules we've discussed in terms of the English language are totally artificial. Shakespeare in senses with of and from, Johnson does. What else? Logic, application of logic to language. Should be space there. And the Latin standard over and against popular usage. Not bearing in mind that English isn't a romance language. English doesn't come from Latin. Yeah, some of our words do, but the grammar, not at all. The writing style, the writing form, not at all. Does that mean you can't mimic Latin style? Yes, you can. And you can do it very well and have very powerful, persuasive arguments. That's one of the reasons why learning Latin is such a great thing to do for an English major. So that you can read some great rhetoric written in Latin. So that you can then model some of your style on that. You know, when I teach composition, I don't teach it the way nearly everybody else does. One of the things we do is we read some older writers like Samuel Johnson. We read some 18th century stuff, okay? And we talk and analyze that about why that's effective writing, as opposed to, you know, including writing with pictures and drawings and cartoons and sound files and all that other minor nonsense. Okay. Um, yeah, we can say.
Recent British and American English. Now, according to the syllabus, the last three days, we're supposed to look at chapters 10, 11, and 12, words and meanings, new words from old, et cetera, et cetera. We might get to some of that, because um, this will probably take at least Tuesday of next week. Yes, we might get to a little bit. At least Tuesday, maybe Thursday, if we go all the way through um, to the stuff dealing with black vernacular English. Right? So, American dialectology. I at least think that's probably um, one of the most interesting things about this period. Hold on, is there anything else I wanted to no. <clears throat> Right. Black English, etc., which at the time when I first wrote up these notes, which I revised them a little bit for now, but I don't think I revised this part at all. Um, they're probably about a good 15 years out of date because black English really isn't the issue it was 15, 20 years ago. When you had mayor of Oakland, uh, mayor of, you know, mayors of some large inner city um large cities with a, a large inner city population um, arguing that you know African American students ought to be allowed to use black vernacular English in classrooms etc cetera, etc cetera, and other people saying do you want these kids to succeed or not because if you do you need to teach them quote unquote standard English etc that issue has kind of fallen by the wayside somewhat but we can we can resurrect it we can put life back into it right so English language in the 19th century. I did bring, if I want to refer to it, yes. Um, this, I mean, we, we, we've been doing it all semester, development of historical linguistics, which really begins in the late 18th century. Remember one of the first things we began with, not the international phonetic alphabet, but in terms of actual language. We were talking about Indo-Europeans, right? Who discovered the quote-unquote Indo-European per se? That guy, William Jones, who delivered that lecture to the Asiatic Society in 1785 and said, Sanskrit is related to Greek and Latin and probably Celtic and some of these other languages. And, you know, I think they come from a common source. Well, that's the beginning of everything we've been doing all semester long. Okay? So, continuing development of some verb forms in English. Even though we thought, you know, the language has kind of been settled during the 18th century, the house is being built is a development in the 1800s. As opposed to, the house is building. Because that sounds like what? Well, we, we need the rest of the predicate. The house is building another house. Like, the house is alive. Uh -huh. The house is building is just what? Present participle, right? We, modern, 21st century, think that doesn't make sense. That's why house is, ah, we change that present participle to add in this existence kind of verb, being, and then we go back and use a past tense for to build. So present perfect, I believe. I always get all the tenses mixed up, right? What else? Decline of British English as an international standard. Well, why? Why in the 19th century, early 20th century, like we can extend that, why would British English decline as an international standard? How so? They got their you-know-what handed to them. Little thing began 1776, ended a few years later. Revolutionary. Revolutionary War. We defeated Britain. We were nobody. Literally, the United States colonies were nothing. And we defeated the greatest power on the face of the earth. Now, yes, 
Napoleon, a few years later, would have a little argument with that. You know, Britain was never the greatest power. France, you know, viva la France, we're always the best at, at everything. And it and Britain, you know, after we defeat Britain, it and Britain went back and forth with a series of wars, okay? So, British English declines as international standard. That doesn't mean American English suddenly tops. American English does not become the international standard till when? Any guesses? After World War One, World War One. Okay. Why? Because it's our infusion into World War One that turns the tables, that allows the Allies to win. Okay. So, slang becomes more commonly accepted. I don't mean it's more commonly accepted in terms of, you know, in formal written publications, scholarly papers. Don't use slang, except one person in here I think is writing about slang. But even then, in writing about <coughs> slang, don't use slang. Don't say I'm going to diss slang, okay? Don't do that. But you're going to have to use slang to talk about it, okay? So... It becomes more commonly accepted. How do we know? Well, this guy writes a dictionary. The vulgar tongue. What's meant by vulgar? Not dirty words. Common. Vulgar, that's us. Well, take that back. Me. Common people. Everyday, ordinary people. Okay? So, clap. How can you have a classical dictionary of ordinary people? Classical implies what? If, if you say, oh, this is destined to be a classic, what does that mean? It'll be used a long time later. So Hollywood, you know, comes out with, somebody comes out with a film. Somebody comes out with a novel. An instant classic. No. No, it can't be an instant classic. It has to stand the past. It has to. <laughs> it's bad enough my phone talks to me. Now my watch is talking to me. Like you know, <laughs> scary, scary days. Okay, it has to stand the test of time in order to be a classic. Okay, but what's the problem with slang? Louder. Okay, it is fluid. What else? Louder. It's temporal, okay? It's short-lived. Give me a modern 20 year, 2019 example of slang that's everywhere used today. Anyway, any slang term, as long as it's clean. <laughs> Take that back. Any slang term. Yeet. Louder? Yeet. Spell it. Y-E-E-T. What's it mean? Tossing something really fast. It's the opposite of yoink, but just as fast. Okay, what's yoink? <laughs> it's when you uh, take something really fast and need is throwing something really fast. Okay. My daughter, my second daughter, uses this all the time. I'm like, yes? <laughs> what the hell are you saying? I don't get it. Okay? Give me something that maybe an old fart like me would have heard. <laughs> Music, film. Something to describe that. Daily living. Something you really like. Fire. Fire. Fire? Yeah. As in, describe it, define it. It's almost like, that, like how we use it, though, like, oh, that's cold, like, that's sweet, like, it's, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> Notice! <laughs> <laughs> exact opposite! Okay? Michael Jackson's bad, which means good. good. Okay. <laughs> Back to you know my period. Groovy. Oh no. <laughs> okay. It's what? Or you know, listen to some John Denver the other day. Far out. No. <laughs> okay, we laugh at those now. Why? Because of this. Nobody uses these. Okay? And probably 
within five years, shorter than that. Nobody's going to use these the way they're now being used. Right? That's why slang is limited. Right? Um, influence of science on language. Give me an example. Think science and its application. What is the pop what's the word for the popular application of science to everyday life? One word. Technology. Okay? 20th century. Technology. Give me an example of words that come from technology that we use daily. Screenshot. Really? <laughs> Boom! <laughs> is that what that means? No. Keyboard. FaceTime, Facebook, I am, I'm going to I am you. Really? Why not DM, Snap? Why not just talk? Maybe, kind of, yeah. You know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that with some of my kids. You know, what do you mean you're talking? Of course you're talking, unless you're using sign language. In which case, you're still kind of talking. But it's not texting, it's, you know, really? <laughs> Why do we have to make things so difficult? When, as Molecaster says, the English language is so rich and beautiful, and we do what with it? It's like a funnel, you know, okay? So those are our examples. I mean, I don't hear this as much today, but 10 years ago, you would hear this everywhere. I interfaced with so and so. No. Yeah, because that can conjure different meanings, you know. Interface, you know. What's it mean? I had a one to one. Okay. That's that's what I said. It's like ten years ago. You'd see this everywhere. Okay. So influence of uh, science on language. Language becomes a cultural barometer in the 19th and 20th century. What's that mean, a cultural barometer? What do you do with a barometer? You check air pressure. Okay. Low, high. Well, it's a measure of culture. Low, high. How does language become that kind of measure? Well, she y'all don't know nothing, do you? Low, high. That's low. Okay. So how you speak indicates what? Your social status, or so it is assumed. Even yet in the Harry Potter novels, at one point. Draco Malfoy makes a comment about the character Hagrid, about how he can't even speak right. Well, Draco Malfoy's pure blood and rich. He speaks correctly. Hagrid, half giant and relatively poor. He doesn't speak correctly. He comes from the wrong social stratus of society. Okay? Spelling reform. Uh, Trying to remember if I do more with spelling reform. Yeah, I got more about spelling reform later, which we'll talk about then. We've only got a couple minutes. So, where are we? Um, I have no idea what English in the 20th century C chart means. <laughs> I'm sure I have a chart, but I don't know. Let me see if it's in this. Don't think it is. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Now, this is really out of date. This is like close to 30 years out of date, probably. Okay? Let's shoot that down. Largest of the Occidental language. What does Occidental mean? 
not accidental pronounced by you. Western. Western, okay? Why? Because what's the largest? Chinese. With its various dialects, okay? So, 350 million speakers using it as a first language. That's not right anymore. Because we have almost 350 million speakers in the United States. You got to add England, which is not that bad. Add what, 20 million? They're barely the size of South Carolina. Don't really do much. Uh, take it. South Carolina doesn't have anywhere near 20 million people. Um, so, 350 million speakers, and this is as of about 1990, 1991. Okay? Um, at least twice that number use English regularly as a second language. For example, you can go to France today and you can not speak a lick of French and get along just fine. You can go to any of the Scandinavian countries. You can go to Germany. Why? English is required. And not just a year, not just two years. It's required all the way, you know, I'll use a German example, through the gymnasium, through high school, every year. So that, you know, you graduate. Why, so why are they requiring English? You want to succeed in business, you better learn English. Because England and the United States have what? Outside China, the largest economy in the world. Take that back. Our, our economy is larger than China. Outside China, the largest market in the world. That is, you want to sell stuff? Here. Yeah, India's got a lot more people. They don't have what? Disposable income. Okay. Most, not all, most Americans do. At least more than they do. Okay. So, Chinese, you know, more than a billion speakers, etc. So here's some other examples of other languages compared to us. Actually, we'll stop there because it's 925. So we'll do that on Tuesday.